Welcome back to the Citizen Channel. Hope you're all staying safe and well. And welcome to our look at the boys of 11 12, which looks at our players during that momentous season. Some perhaps have started out around then, some have been with us a while. Uh, and some, yeah, some are perhaps finishing finishing their careers at City at that uh, momentous season, of course, 11 12, when we uh, landed that Premiership title at 93 20 in such wonderful circumstances. So this is we're going to have a look today at Nigel De Jong. Yes, Nigel De Jong. This is part one of two, guys. So please uh, keep your eyes open for part two when that's available. Uh, please, if you are new to the channel, push that subscribe button. We do everything City past and present and forever on this channel. Well, I also have a little film and TV channel as well. So if that's of any interest to you, give, give that a look as well. Information, vlogs, and I try and ent entertain and inform on there as well. But today, it's a Citizen channel. Today, it's Nigel de Jong, of course. Please give it your thumbs up if you can and press that notification so you know part two is coming out. You'll know, know when that's coming out. Right, part one of Nigel de Jong. Yeah, he was born in Amsterdam on the 30th of November 1984. So he's still only a spring chicken as I'm recording this. His farmer was his farmer. His former <laughs> his father is a former uh, Dutch international, Jerry de Jong. Uh, he actually walked out on the family at quite an early age. I think it was previous to Nigel joining the revered Ajax Academy at the time. I don't think that was the reason he walked out. Just these things happen. That's life, isn't it? These, these things happen. And, of course, Nigel was the eldest. Well, of course, he was the eldest child. And he took over the sort of man of the house responsibilities, if you like. On 19th of October 2002, at the age of 17, so just short of his 18th birthday, he made his debut there for the Ajax first team and he scored his first goal of his senior career on 18th of February 2003. In a 1 1 draw against Arsenal, yeah, against uh, mighty Arsenal in the Champions League. Remember when they used to get in the Champions League, they might still be doing, depending when you're watching this. In 2004 5, his last full season in Amsterdam, uh, Nigel was named Ajax Player of the Season, so he's doing very, very well. After a period where he uh, after a period when he appeared regularly in midfield, he found himself sitting on the bench more often than being in the starting lineup, which wasn't have suited. On the 7th of December 2005, it was announced that De Jong did not wish to extend his contract with Ajax. He fell out with him, fell out with him a bit, sticking him on the bench, which was due to end in July 2006. He obviously uh, didn't didn't like the old splinters in the bum on the bench. That's that's for sure. And on January 26, 2006. De Jong signed a four and a half year contract contract at Bundesliga club Hamburg. Yep, the transfer fee, a massive, a massive one million pound, one million euros even at that time. So it wasn't even one million pound, was it, guys? It was a lot cheaper than that. So it doesn't sound a lot these days, does it? In March 2006, De Jong scored the winning goal in Bayern Munich's first ever defeat at the Allianz Arena. So there's a, there's one for the record books. And the following week. He received his first red card, <laughs> so no surprises there. The first red card of his career, so he had to, he had survived quite a while without getting one. He hadn't received any for Ajax, so wasn't too bad. And it was for a second booking in the UEFA Cup match against Rapid Bucharest at the time, January twenty first, two thousand and nine. Yeah, well, he signed. He signed for us, didn't he? he? Signed for City from Hamburg. Although we had tried actually to sign him a year earlier, but uh, the deal couldn't be finalised in time before before the deadline. So we, he should have really been at uh, our place twelve months earlier. It was a big decision. Hamburg had made him their highest paid player, so he was was well thought of there. But uh, obviously, the law of, of playing in England uh, was proved too much, and for an estimated fee of eighteen million pounds, so it had gone up a little bit over the years. Paid, of course, by our manager then and the, the team behind our manager, Mark Hughes who actually deployed him in a role of midfield enforcer. Yeah, kind of a bit of his nickname, the enforcer. In a team, let's face it, whose defence badly needed reinforcement at the time. He signed a four-and-a-half-year contract and he joined, of course, Company and Zabaleta, who just joined, had been in, at City as well. He made his debut for City in an assured performance. Yes, that's the word assured, so that's good, isn't it? Against Newcastle United on the 28th of January 2009. And City sat just below mid table in 12. So we weren't setting the world alight, but it was early days, wasn't it, guys? In his programme notes at the, at the time, Hughes said of his signing, 
is one of the best midfielders of his type in Europe and is already an experienced international. He will bolster us in and around the area. We have needed more options to choose from. And of course, he's already been a teammate of Vinnie Companies at Hamburg. If he can fit in as well as Vincent, ha, then he could make a real impact here. Yeah, probably not far wrong. De Jong on his move was quoted as saying, this is the next step in his career after three years of the Bundesliga. He was attracted by the ideas and planning behind the club. He said the Premier League may be the biggest competition in the world. You're probably right, mate. He gave his first full interview uh, to City and to Paul McDowell for the City Match Day programme for the Premier League game versus Middlesbrough on the 7th of February 2009. And he talked about his role. So I'll just, I'll just read a little couple of excerpts from that. Uh, I am the sort of guy who likes the battle in midfield to win the ball for my teammates and give it to the offensive players to score a lot of goals. That's my job, to work for the team. And that's what I'll be doing at Manchester City and doing my best at it, he explains. I actually started as an attacking midfielder scoring a lot of goals, but gradually moved back and for the last two or three years, I've been playing in front of the back four. I enjoy it and believe it's an important to have a player like that in the team. It is not a position that you associate with glory, but wouldn't other teams have been successful without the likes of Vieira or Makalele, he asks. Those who make room for the Ferraris of football, the individuals who turn a game with pace and skill, mark the, marks the memory, puts a spring in the step of fans on the way home from the game. Yes, yeah, so obviously the early the early versions of a defensive midfielder, wasn't it? Obviously, we, we obviously ended up with Fernandino playing that role. Now, as I'm recording this, got the likes of uh, Rodri playing that role. He actually finished the piece by saying, it was a big decision to come here because I was very happy at Hamburg. Uh, it was the winter break and the team is doing well in the Bundesliga, just two points behind the leaders. But I talked to people behind the club here about the ideas, the plan for Manchester City for the next two or three years. I'm now looking forward to being part of those plans and ambitious for my football career for this club. I'm still young and have a lot to achieve here. As a parting shot, he adds, what lies be behind his drive on the football pitch? Playing football has got to be the best job in the world. When you come into a stadium, see it full of fans cheering for you. You get the feel of the atmosphere. I get a rush of adrenaline. I believe every every man deep in his heart wants to be a football player. Probably right, mate. At whatever level, just to experience the joy of playing the game, he concludes. Well, it's not too bad playing on a on a on a, a park as well for a, for a team, is it? But we. We totally understand what Mr. De Jong was talking about there. I mean, he wasn't only a footballer. He was already a successful businessman with his own business selling luxury cars to the elite. Hey, if you're going to sell, if you're going to make make a profit in business, sell something big and expensive. So you only have to sell one a week and make it. You can make plenty of money. That that's what I was told once, but I never I never followed that idea. I always always followed always sold loads and obviously for a, a small margin. But hey, that's that's why I was never successful, I suppose. City finished ten. Uh, in the 08-09 season, De Jong made 16 appearances. And of course, we would actually play De Jong's old club, Hamburg, in the UEFA Cup and, uh, and go out and quite an emotional night, if you remember at Eastlands, if you were there that night. Uh, he himself couldn't play in that game. He was, in, he was ineligible to play in it, so he actually didn't play in it. Uh, De Jong was surprisingly, yeah, surprisingly on the bench for the first four games of the 09-10 season with Gareth Barrett and Colo Torre added to the squad. So for a guy, the Dutch nicknamed the Terrier, yeah, they call him the Terrier, he was itching to start and got his chance and played wonderfully in a 4-2 win over Arsenal on the 12th of September 2009. A certain Adebayo ruffled a few Arsenal fans' feathers, didn't he? And Arsenal, Arsenal behind the scenes at Arsenal that day with a, with a certain celebration. But there was a definite, there was definitely a slight rift then. Obviously, after missing those first four games, a little slight rift and a few cracks as uh, between Hughes and, of course, our new Dutch enforcer. But by December, yeah, Hughes was out, and Mancini continued to use him as his enforcer. As with Hughes, he was probably one of the. As with Hughes initially, he was probably one of the first names on Mancini's team sheet. 
when he joined the club. But by the end of the 9-10 season, he'd become a, a firm fan's favourite, of course, as well, with all these gutsy displays. A little bit borderline sometimes, let's be honest about it. And, of course, when De Jong sliding in was a particular particular favourite in response to his no messing about tackles, of course, in front of the back four. Well, there we go. In part two, we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up uh, season ten, eleven, where cracks, those cracks that had shown under Hughes, begin to show under Mancini as well. So we're going to pick that up in part two. So please join me for that and leave your comments, any of your memories on Nigel De Jong, and hopefully you will enjoy part two of the boys of eleven, twelve. Nigel De Jong. Thanks for watching. Where we're going to do the rest of the day. Have a great one. Catch yourselves. Catch your friends. Catch your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. To be here again on the Citizen Channel. I only ask one thing, don't I? Please stay safe, Blues. Come on, City. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.